I look forward to hearing more about the fall conference or fall workshop with Renee, because this is exactly what I'm working with. I'm working with trying to overcome barriers to privacy when releasing data. At the Census Bureau, the reason we exist is to collect data and disseminate it, and disseminate it with stewardship, disseminate it privately, so that we protect the identities of the people who give us the data. It's not a theoretical construct for us to protect our data. If we don't protect our data, then people are not going to give us data, and we will no longer have the monthly unemployment rate, the monthly inflation rate, the leading economic indicators that go out all the time. That comes from us. And so it's very important for us that we have public trust. That is the reason we exist. So I work for the Center for Disclosure Avoidance Research, and it is a pretty bombastic phrase to say disclosure avoidance. We try to minimize disclosure as much as possible. And that's really what we're getting at with avoidance. We are doing everything everything possible to protect our data. <laughs> Jane was saying earlier about, about trying to hear from people in the trenches. I'm deep in the trenches. <laughs> we're, we're, I'm seeing licensing agreements, all kinds of ways to bring about new methods. In fact, at the Census Bureau, we are really retooling our efforts to get the best technologies as possible to keep our data private. So I know that some of our computer scientists are going to roll their eyes when they hear this. I had been a very proud 30 years continuous user of SAS. And now I am very rapidly moving into R and Python very quickly. And in fact, the people who are really good in R and Python are moving into Scala. So we are definitely moving towards newer methods, innovations, so that we can keep data private. Uh, before I begin, just so I know who's here, I have some questions for you. How many of you have ever worked with or created model-based synthetic data? Hands? Synth okay, a few of you. I have exactly one equation in my presentation for the theoretical computer scientists. How many of you are familiar with that wonderful term, e to the epsilon? Yeah, more of you. And how many of you, especially in the AV people in the back, never raise your hand when I ask a question? <laughs> yes! See, there's always one in the audience. <laughs> okay. You got it. Exactly. Okay, there's the disclaimer. You've seen it. I move on. Okay, so acknowledgments. We did not do this on our own. Uh, within CEDAR, Center for Disclosure Avoidance Research, many people have touched this presentation. We want to make sure that what I'm presenting today is clear, is understandable, and I don't share too much. <laughs> that was because I even have privacy limitations on what I can share today. Seriously. And we, we take our direction from our Associate Director for Research and Methodology and Chief Scientist. Many of you know him because he's very active in formal and, and differential privacy, John Abad. Okay, here's my roadmap. You can call it an outline. I'll be talking about giving you actual definitions of personally identifiable information and statistical disclosure limitation. I really come from the statistics side of disclosure avoidance. Talk about the Census Bureau and privacy and how that is critical to who we are. Legacy methods of statistical disclosure limitation at the US Census Bureau, which is what most of our programs are using. We are using dated methods. I'm saying that openly. We collect lots of data. We have ongoing surveys that are monthly, that are, that are annually. We have three types of censuses. One you know of, of course, is the 10-year decennial census of population and housing. That's what gets power and money to Congress. That's what draws the congressional districts, determines how many representatives are, are apportioned to every state. We also have an economic census every five years uh, to give us the state of the economy. We even have a census of governments. We have a lot of governments in the United States, and we do take a census of them as well. We have ongoing improvements on our legacy methods, and we are all moving rapidly towards innovation in statistical disclosure limitation and census. And then I offer challenges, opportunities, and final remarks. Feel free to ask questions anytime. I'd prefer if you hold them to the end, but if it's burning, please ask me, because if sometimes when I have a burning question, I might not listen to other things, so if it's burning, ask. And just for everybody's sake, I have a slide of, so you know how far along I am. 
Okay, from an OMB memorandum from this year, the definitions of personally identifiable information is continuing to evolve on an annual basis. The term PII refers to information that can be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity, either alone or when combined with other information that is linked or linkable to a specific individual. That's the challenge with de-identification or things like safe harbor, where you're concerned that even if you drop certain identifiers, the ability to use record linkage on the others could be compromising. Statistical disclosure limitation and disclosure avoidance are statistical methods used in the processing of data prior to releasing data products to ensure the confidentiality of responses. And de-identification is a specific process that removes identifiers. When Safe Harbor was made for the health industry, 18 seemed that they would that you would really have a you would have a de-identified data set, but would it truly be private? Private from the non-computer science definition of it. Re-identification is a method to avoid uncovering PII through record link. So we want to avoid, so we do re-identification studies on the inside. We basically become our own hackers. We try to hack ourselves. Hack in terms of record linkage. So we know of other data sets that have similar information to ours. We use record linkage on them from our public use data set. So we see what the suspected links are. Then because we have the internal use data on the inside, we then figure out what percentage of our suspected links are confirmed. We call that a conditional re-identification rate. We don't mind if people think they know our information. We're concerned that they do know. And the concern here is that we want to make sure that those rates stay low. They only give us an information about one data set attacking another or being linked to another. We don't know from doing a re-identification study that a data set that we are releasing for public use is safe. All we know is whether there are severe problems or we don't know that there are severe problems. Think of it like hypothesis testing. You don't accept an alternative hypothesis. You either reject or don't reject. So we either see that there are problems or we don't see that there are problems. That's what you get from a re-identification study. So one thing that we have been doing in order to release data is doing a re-identification study. And in fact, just recently in the last couple months, we had to tell our internal stakeholders, you have to take these five variables off because they are linkable. And they did. And the data are released. Okay, so happily for the, the theoretical computer scientists, the database reconstruction theorem is also known as the fundamental law of information recovery. And a powerful result says that too many statistics published too accurately from a confidential database exposes the entire database with certainty. And of course, what is too accurately? The cumulative noise must be of order square root of the population size. So if you infuse noise, you want to make sure you infuse enough noise so that you maintain privacy. As mentioned earlier, the Census Bureau collects data from households and establishments and produces statistic results. <coughs> It's not something we want to do. It's something that congressional law tells us we must do. So from US Code Title 13, Section 9, we, the following are prohibited. Use the information furnished under the provisions of this title for any other purpose other than the statistical purposes for which it is supplied, or make any publication whereby the data furnished by any particular establishment or individual, because we collect economic data, under this title can be identified, or permit anyone other than the sworn officers and employees of the department or bureau or agency thereof to examine the individual reports. Definitely sounds congressional. The thing that's important for us, even working at the Census Bureau, it is amazingly difficult. I am first person saying this. We even have a hard time sharing data on one survey with each other within the building. 
I mean, we're all federal, in the building, we're all sworn emp federal employees, and we have huge barriers just to share our data with each other. That is how much we are trying to keep our data private. It's even harder for us on the inside to get at our own data, unless we have a need to know and a justification to get at the data. Sorry, burning question. Yeah, burning question. That's why I like burning questions. So, given what you said, so it seems number three would not prevent that internal sharing because you're sworn officers, right. and employees. Number two would not prevent the sharing because it's not a publication. Right. So, is the interpretation that it's number one that prevents it that it is against its purpose? Yes, because we because people th you know. <laughs> Common misbelief, not, not with here, but in, in the field when we collect data from households, there is a common belief that the government is on one computer and it is broken. And of course, when I've gone out and observed interviews with our field representatives, I like to tell their respondents, yes, it's broken, but if you provide us data, we will help fix it. <laughs> so yes, um, we have barriers to sharing data with each other because we need to have a need to know exactly number one and we have to we have to clearly identify why we're using it so we release reports tables and infographs and the challenging one micro data public use files to satisfy the statutory requirements the census bureau applies disclosure avoidance procedures to all of our public products and we are currently moving from legacy products to innovative new statistical disclosure limitation techniques. I think it's important for me to share what those legacy methods, because that is what we are using. And you will see from the description of these legacy methods how far we are coming. Okay, so there are three different types of legacy methods that we use. We use information reduction, we use data perturbation, and we have a growing network of f federal statistical research data centers where if you get access, you have access to the internal use data. Our researchers in academia love FSRDCs because they get the real data. Okay, so here's some information reduction methods. These pretty much rounded out. We have top and bottom coding. Top coding is where we take the outliers and we censor them after a certain point. We either censor them all the way down to the censored value or we take the weighted average of those above the censored out of value and put it there. We also do it on the bottom side. You see this most in things like income and other monetary adventures. One thinks about Warren Buffett and you, know, you look at people's data from Omaha, Nebraska, we need to protect his data because it would be obvious which was him, which was his. We have cell or item suppression. When we have a cell and we know that there are too few observations in a cell, we suppress that cell. We put a Z or an X or some other marker to say that we cannot disclose that information because it is too low. But one of our biggest concerns about disclosure is disclosure by subtraction. That if you take the marginal and you subtract the inner cells, you'll get to the one that you that you're we're trying to to avoid so we have to take complementary cells and suppress them as well so to to avoid one cell we have to also disclose three other cells even though they had adequate sample in them we also as i mentioned earlier remove variables from tables and files because we know that they can be linked controlled rounding is an evolving science. One thinks that, you know, from when you first ever did rounding, it'd be straightforward. But we need to make sure that we preserve relationships, we preserve control totals, that if we round too much, then we might not get, just by chance, we might not get to the totals that are also published. And then sampling. For our decennial census, we put out a public use microdata sample file where we take one, five, or 10% of the respondents. That way, if you saw someone that looked familiar, you don't know that everyone who was, who was in the, who, was, who received, where we received information is in that database. So sampling works very well as a statistical disclosure limitation technique. So these are the ones that we are using for most of our data products. Data perturbation methods at the US Census Bureau. Swapping, where we take the information from one household or one business and swap it with one in a slightly different geography. Because for, for, for economic surveys and censuses, the big question is sectors, 
products for, for demographic information, almost always, it's geography. People want information at the block level, but we can't share everything, so we have used swapping, and that's very popular in our demographic censuses and special products that we do from the censuses. We also do random noise infusion, where we put where no matter what the size of the cell it is, that we may, we may perturb it with some information so that you don't have an exact number. Uh, now with things like Zillow and Realtor.com, you can match on actual price of house sales. So by perturbing it, you can't, you can't do it so easily. Partially and fully synthetic database construction, that's where we model noise infusion, similar to multiple imputation. We have two products that have, have been very helpful. The survey of income and program participation, those, that gives us a lot of poverty measures. And it is, this is the interesting part, it is a synthetic database which is linked to IRS and Social Security Administration data. They are authorized to give us the data, but we are not authorized to give it to them. We, again, talk about licensing agreements. We have very strong agreements. And I just want to be clear about something in my notes that, uh, yep. In our synthetic longitudinal business database, we have, in both of these, we have what's a validation server. A validation server is amazing. It is a way to encourage people, to, and especially researchers from academia, to use our synthetic data sets because what we will do for you, we won't, mere, verification servers basically tell you how well the models did or how well your analysis is, but, or how well you did, but in a validation server, you can take your programs, give it to us offline, and we will tell you what the actual what the actual parameters would be. We will not share the raw data with you, but you will have a good understanding of of what the difference is, literally in terms of results from the synthetic data and the actual data. We will provide that to you. So validation servers can only be accessed by internal census staff and not ex external researchers, but you give us our programs, you give us your programs, and we will run it against our data on the inside. Okay, federal statistical research data centers. There are partnerships between federal statistical agencies and research institutions. They are often located at universities. The access is restricted, the access to restricted use microdata is for statistical purposes. There are 24 locations and one literally opening tomorrow, Tuesday, at Georgetown University. <laughs> and one would think, why, why would we need them in Washington? Because it is difficult to, we have two layers of security just to get into the Census Bureau. By going into the FSRDC, there is a layer of security, but it is easier for you to access the, the internal use data. Research proposals and output are reviewed for conformance to disclosure avoidance standards by administrators at the FSRDCs and headquarters personnel who specialize in disclosure avoidance. So we review your proposal, we review your output. So you don't just come into an FSRDC, run your analysis and run with it. We make sure that it, it conforms to our standards. So here's an example of the way people work with data. So we want researchers who want to access data, and then we have an organization with confidential data. So the researcher goes to the organization, conducts research, and they're processed with disclosure avoidance methods. The advantage is that statistics are run on the confidential data. The disadvantage is that it's slow and expensive, and only those privileged researchers can get access. On the other hand, we provide microdata to people. So in other words, you can go on the internet right now and get a public use data set from, say, the American Housing Survey. This is, so we publish de-identified microdata. The researchers can use the data wherever they are, even at the beach, and results do not receive further disclosure limitation. These are, when I mean public use file, they're yours. You can reissue them. So when the Census Bureau is trying to find out who is using our data, it's not enough to know who is downloading from our website. We then have to talk to the people who download our data and who are they providing the data to. It is a cycle. So inferences cannot usually be corrected to account for the disclosure limitation methods, and there's an important, uh, th there's an imp important reference on that, and that de-identified data may still leak sensitive information. That's something we're concerned about. 
So we have ongoing improvements. We are continuing to work with cell suppression so that we suppress fewer cells, have higher quality, and only suppress cells when we need them, and we use them in economic censuses and surveys. We are also expanding our network of fully and partially synthetic databases. So fully synthetic is where everything is modeled. Partially synthetic is where key variables, especially uh, demographic variables that don't seem very, very likely for disclosure, they're maintained constant, and then we use those to model everything else. Okay, now we're moving to innovations. Formal privacy and differential privacy is where we are going. Randomized response, a survey technique invented in the 1960s, was the first differentially private mechanism implemented by any statistical agency, although it was not a conscious decision. And the technique is difficult to adapt to modern survey collection methods. That's something that we face at the Census Bureau, and I'll talk more about later. When a lot of computer scientists and academics think about controlling data, they're talking about the rows and columns of a data set. For us in statistics, this is we're not really looking at the sample of data, which is representing the data set. We're looking at the survey weights, replica weights, and all the other weights to make projections to a universe. So the protecting the survey data is important, but protecting the analytical valid validity is equally important. So the first production application of a formally private disclosure limitation system by any organization was the Census Bureau's on the map on the residential side, a geographic query system, a query, or query response system for studying residents and workplace patterns. This is for people who want to look for commuting patterns in very small places. One reason why we like to put publish synthetic data is that you can get higher, you can get more granularity. You can go to deeper geographic levels, deeper sectors in the economy into products where we couldn't if we were using our oldest methods. So here is the one formula for our theoretical computer science. Uh, differential privacy ensures that the addition or removal of a single row in a database has a bounded impact, I enjoy putting that in red, e to the epsilon, on the probability distribution of outputs. It implies that the amount of information disclosed about a single row is limited relative to what is already known. This is a difficult concept for me as a statistician to grasp. For the theoreticians with you, it is elegant. The issue that we have is that this works for any two data sets, any two data sets, even potential data sets. So it is not possible to empirically validate that we have achieved differential privacy. It can only be proven theoretically, because this is a guarantee that helps us in past data sets, present data sets, and future data sets. This is the direction we're going. Formal privacy uses generalized semantics for which differential privacy is a special case. Epsilon is the privacy loss budget. Budget or production possibilities frontier, PPF, is an economics term which is equivalent to the one I like, receiver operating characteristics are the ROC curve for statisticians. It constrains aggregate risk or partial database reconstruction given all published statistics. It is a worst case limit to the inferential disclosure of any identity, identity or item. So this is our threshold that we do not go beyond. In differential privacy, the worst case is over all possible databases with the same schema for all individuals and items. All released statistics can never permit a database reconstruction more accurate than its budget. So this gives us protection into the indefinite future. And for differential privacy, the guarantee is over all future attackers and any database with the same schema. This is us looking forward. Okay. Disclosure limitation is a technology. It shows the relation between privacy loss, which is considered a public bad, and data accuracy, analytic validity, which is considered a public good. Any point on that technology 
is feasible. So a differentially private system can publish extremely disclosive data. This happens if the privacy loss budget, that epsilon, is set very high. The extremely disclosive data are also very accurate. That is, they permit a very accurate reconstruction of the confidential data relative to the reconstruction possible with a smaller privacy loss budget. The whole curve is called that PPF in economics, or the ROC in statistics, and in statistical disclosure limitation, specifically to us, we call it a risk utility curve. There's risk, there's utility. It is the slope of that curve that captures the technological trade-off between data accuracy and privacy loss. That slope is called the price of data accuracy in terms a foregone privacy, also known as the marginal cost of data accuracy. That marginal social cost cannot be used to determine an optimal data accuracy or privacy loss point because it cannot measure the social benefits, only the social cost. To measure the social benefits, you would need a model of preference. So anyone who's ec economist here would enjoy those kinds of models. <laughs> models of preferences are independent of models of te technology and economics and in general. And so this slide I'm about to show you is deliberately incomplete to make this point. So let me move forward. So it's difficult to set an optimal point. And here we go. So there's, here's an example of the curve. And the slopes, you notice, they're different. So the question is, where is that slope that you want to be? There are some people, like computer scientists, who are very concerned about privacy loss. The slope would be here. Whereas social scientists and many, many, and, and many researchers want the slope to be more like this, because analytic validity is critically important. And the problem is, where do we find that common ground? And that means that we need to learn about preferences and what our data users want. So differential privacy delivered the whole curve, not just any one point on the curve. So where should an agency be, lo be located? Differential privacy is useless for answering the question without adding a preference map and a theory for optimal choice. And economics supplies those components. So how do we prove that a privacy loss budget was respected? We have to quantify the privacy loss expenditure of every publication, every request, every data usage. The collection of the algorithms taken together must satisfy the privacy loss budget and not exceed it. This means that the collection of algorithms used must have known composition properties. Our information environment, as all of you know in this room, is changing far faster than before. It may no longer be reasonable to assert that a product is empirically safe given best practice disclosure limitation prior to its release. Formal privacy models replace empirical assessment, which is what we are accustomed to doing with re-identification studies where we do the record linkage, with designed protection that we put in up front that have proven theoretical properties. So this gives us resistance to all future attacks is a property of the design. The teams at the Census Bureau working on formal privacy methods for disclosure avoidance have been charged by our bureau director, presidentially appointed, with developing technologies with adjustable parameters to control the privacy loss and data accuracy during implementation. These technologies will be summarized using graphs like that and other supporting materials. We have a disclosure review board that brings people from across the agency to review every product that is leaving the Census Bureau. That, the disclosure review board will make a recommendation regarding the appropriate formal privacy technology and parameter settings, including the privacy loss parameter. And setting that privacy loss parameter is really looking at what slope are we working from in terms of this risk utility curve. Then, 
The disclosure, please. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> I'm a little confused why the slope is the relevant thing here. Well, the, you see that the slope is constantly changing. So, it, so basically, the slope determines the trade-off between privacy loss and and data v analy analytic validity. Uh, yeah, no, I'm so confused. So, <laughs> I mean, you want you, you know one can one could, might argue for a, a high kind of high accuracy, and you know you might say there's a certain accuracy that's required, say for reasonable redistricting. Uh, there is a certain, you know, privacy law upper bound that's required for compliance with Title 13, whatever it is. The neither, neither requirements of that, you know, stipulations of those forms don't involve sort of slope, but rather just how high you are on the y-axis or how far to the left or right you are on the x-axis. So, you know, if this curve were really bumpy, the slope would be meaning, meaningless. Correct. So I guess that's why I'm confused why you keep on saying that slope is the thing. Uh, this is the way, this is, its slope is the way that we approach the value of epsilon. That is the, that is the method that we use to approach it. So, so if I might add something, Adam. So Please. I'm coming from a completely different perspective. So I work at Google and we sort of do data Yep. Yeah, so I work at Google and we, we sort of do data collection and we're actually using uh, Rapport, which has differential privacy. And I think I can understand what they're trying to get at from a computer science perspective, which is that uh, in order to sort of determine how much privacy you want, what, what noise you want to add, and how much utility you get out of it, one way to convince users of this data is that, oh, by the way, if you add a little less noise, you're not going to get that much more in utility. So the kind of the slope is what lets you sell it to them to say that, hey, this is kind of the best you can do. If you're somewhere down there in that region, and then you show them to experiments that say, hey, by the way, with epsilon one, you get this, with epsilon two, you get this. Okay. There's no reason they're going to choose epsilon one, so because it's just so much more better. Whereas you want to say with epsilon three, you get this, with epsilon four, you get this, and ah, it's like maybe a 10% improvement or something, so let's let's go with user privacy, things like that. <laughs> I think that, yes. that sort of makes uh, as, as, uh, computer science yeah. perspective. Yeah. Again, this is where it's the retooling. So not only am I retooling and learning more uh, more software packages, I'm also retooling to speak the language of theoretical computer scientists. Again, this is a change for me personally, because as a mathematical statistician, I want to have methods that are empirically validated. And this gives us a direction to move in the future to protect against big data that we're not even aware of. Yes? So it's a simplification that you're using slope because you really want to measure the effect of any increment of change yes. rather than be an instantaneous value. Because, and also when we do this epsilon, this epsilon is this budget for all queries or all releases of data from that data set moving into the future. So it's something that we need to protect over time. So there was the issue about the 20, uh, well, upcoming 2020 decennial census of population and housing. We want to make sure that we put out, because it's uh, legally mandated, completely, completely accurate, no noise on numbers that have to do with reapportionment and redistricting. So then for some parts of the data that we are releasing, we can put more noise or more more modeled, more uh, synthetically infused information. And for some, we can't put any at all. I mean, this is legal mandating on us. So where I was talking about before is that we have a disclosure review board, which then reports to senior leaders at the agency called the Data Stewardship Executive Committee, which chartered the disclosure review board. So we put our recommendation on where we move forward to the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee. They talk about policy ramifications. That's why I talk about government here. <laughs> And then, then it goes off to the director of the Census Bureau that determines what is our our privacy loss budget because that will have a com that will have a direct impact on on that um, that relationship between marginal social benefit and marginal social cost. So the, the director will choose all parameters to be implemented in any production system. And although this is more explicit than in previous censuses, this is the same procedure that was used in 2020 and 2010. 
And to give you an example of what used to be the most secret number, which I, of course I cannot say, was our swap rate. Because if you knew the swap rate, you would know what proportion of households were not swapped. So, so in legacy methods, in legacy methods, we had, we, we had issues with, with maintaining our privacy. In this case, we will be publishing what our epsilon is. Okay. Uh, okay. So, differential privacy is robust to background knowledge of the data. Sequential and parallel composability. Sequential is where if you keep asking more questions, it keeps adding to that loss budget. But parallel, if you go to like different components of the data, whether different geographies and or different sectors because you're now compartmentalizing, then at that point it doesn't add because it adds the same amount and it doesn't, it, um, it doesn't add to your loss budget by asking more than one sector, more than one geography. It allows for post-processing edits, and the privacy proven guarantees hold even if big data external sources are published or released later. So this is our this is our path to doing this. Formally private synthetic microdata. The model has intentional errors introduced to make noise, and quantifying privacy privacy lo loss can be mathematically established and proven. So we have near term we have near term plans for disclosure. Uh, um, disclosure, uh, differential privacy implementation. I want to share some concerns as well. The commonly used flattened histogram representation of the universe is calculated not as all people, but as the Cartesian product of all potential combinations of all responses for all variables. And this often gives us orders of magnitude larger than the total population, even when structural zeros are imposed. So policymakers, and this, in our case, the director of the Census Bureau, must have enough information about the privacy loss data accuracy trade-off to make an informed decision about epsilon. And there I kept it in a friendly color. I didn't make it red this time. In some cases, the amount of noise infusion from differential privacy may limit the suitability for use of the published statistics to more narrowly defined domains than has historically been true. So we have algorithmic ob obstacles as well, again, to excite our theoreticians. We have integer counts. Modeling, we, want, we may want to have non-integer counts because it fits the model better, but people would feel uncomfortable seeing non-integers. Uh, non also, our models sometimes work better if we have negativity, but we don't want to allow negativity. We also have publicly known counts that things need to add up to. We have structural zeros. We don't want to have three-year-old grandmothers. And then by all of these issues that you may have these small biases versus large aggregations when they build up. So we need to be careful with that. Technical issues moving forward. Currently, our synthetic data set methods must be created for every confidential data set. So we need generic methods that will work on a broader range of data sets. It may also be difficult to find meaningful correlations not representing the model. The model must anticipate the analysis that will be done. We need better modeling building tools. And we also need generic tools for correlating arbitrary models with the ones used to build the synthetic data. Re reproducible science methods will be required to use synthetic data effectively. My big concern from the world of complex surveys with stratification and clustering and panel studies. Data are often collected with a complex sample design in government surveys with considerable missing data and in panels of longitudinal data where in our public use files you can follow the same individual from time to time. When you follow that person from time to time you have more information about that person even if there is de-identification. So research is ongoing with great interest to ensure that weighted longitudinal analysis using differential private data will continue to produce good results and good science of values to our data users, especially the economists that like to follow an individual or a household or an establishment for 50 years and more. Opportunities, differential privacy, and synthetic data may allow for data at finer granularity, as I mentioned earlier, for demographic surveys and censuses at lower geographies. We, there is a Loving County, Texas with 100 people in it. People want to know information about Loving County. We say the only way to do it is synthetic. Economic surveys and censuses at more specific interests, industry, sector, and product levels. Final remarks. This transition from legacy to innovation involves 
personal retooling of methods for our career mathematical statisticians, such as myself, and this transition will help the Census Bureau lead similar innovation across the US federal government and beyond. We are heavily in the trenches and want to work with you. That's it. As may have, many of you may have noticed, when I saw the number five, my pace sped up. <laughs> Please, uh, I'm just. Can you put the slide back? I have the restrictions. The, the uh, three, three things. I'm just. Um, I don't know, maybe number five or six. Uh, let's see. Uh, the concerns or no, no, no. The restrictions on use of data <clears throat> and what, what allows you to. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, the, the, the rules that, that rules. For, the, first, the first one was data must be used only for the purpose for which it's collected. Oh, oh, that's at the very beginning. Sorry. Okay, now we're we're here. Uh, title thirteen. So yeah. just a second. Title thirteen. Now I know where you are. There we go. So I actually I wondered about, about the first one. Uh, sure. You, you have to. You can only use data for the purpose for which it is designed. Co design or collected originally. So I'm, I'm wondering how, how finely, how well defined our purpose is. Uh, I, I seem to remember filling out forms, for example, where the, per the, the, the U.S. government form that says the per you are filling this out to fulfill the laws of the United States. Which does that require me to know the entire U.S. code before I fill out this form, for example? We we have a we have a very big policy office. We have a policy officer. We have a privacy officer, and we have an office of general counsel where where lawyers are gainfully employed. So when there is a question, first come to us, and we'll say what we are able to share. That's that's where we are. Oh, I'm, I don't know if that gets at your question, but it, it really de it, it depends. I'm sorry, that's the okay. typical legal answer. The, the question is sort of getting at the idea that you can collect data for some given purpose. If the purpose is, is, is broadly and specified, that would seem to permit using it for a very broad range of, of, of uh, statistical studies. Um, and an, an example of something that we are not allowed to do is uh, if I, even if I have access to my own data set that I can do analysis on, I can't look up information on the person in the neighboring cube because there is not a need to know. That is actually a violation and I have the data right in front of me. In other words, I can't look at micro, I can't be looking up information on internal microdata without a need to know even if I have the data accessible to me. I don't know, this may steer in a different direction, but um, you're making me think about so many things. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, you are making me think as well. <laughs> One of the things that I remember came up in our workshop was um, allowing people to opt in. Yes. And, you know, just for the greater good, like this is happening in genomics research where people are like, you know, okay, forget it. If I can help, I don't care about my privacy. Is there anything happening in the census, and I don't know if it's fair to ask you. Oh, yes. Where people are saying, fine, study me, you know, my family over the next whatever years, or oh. whatever census things you're taking. Uh, okay, well, I was thinking about, okay, opt-in. Well, you can answer it how yeah, you want, yeah, yeah. because it's an interesting idea. Without saying too much, we have looked at many different ways to do licensing agreements. Do we ask people to register with us that they're using data. The issue with registering with us to get public use data is that it's public use. They, no, 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 it's public use in that they can then share it with other people and we don't know what other people are doing with it. And as I mentioned from the floor, uh, we have the Freedom of Information Act that people can try to go against us for getting data that we may consider private, but lawyers may not. So we, in the in the environment of FOIA, in the environment of people realistically wanting to have access to data, I mean, the reason I'm paid by taxpayers is to collect data and to disseminate it. My part of it is making sure that we do that and we do it in a way that respects those who gave us their data. Yeah, one more question. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's great talk, and it's kind of eye-opening. And the one thing I'm always curious, so someone very concerned about their privacy, some will be not. Say, I don't care. I can have all your, my information, or all my, even medical information. Or just get it from Facebook. Yeah, right. yeah. So in that case, there may be some models to have, uh, 
even like a pricing model, something like a market that uh, you don't care about this uh, data, and then you can use this data to do research. So, some I would be concerned about people who may not want us to want to give us data. That may be highly correlated with the information we want to collect from them. And best example is income. Yeah, um, so I think this is just a fantastic example of, a, of an old institution completely rethinking and retooling the way they do things, and I think that's great. Thank you. Um, and yet, <laughs> you made certain assumptions that you took as fixed, right? So I, I can't remember all, we had a slide of like, like there's a public count and we have to add up to the public count or that things have to be. We have, we have a lot of constraints. Yeah. yeah, so, but like, we're familiar with things that don't add up, right? Like this disclaimer percentages may not add up to 100 due to rounding. So why do you- Not, do not you, you. Your, your guys are wonderful. No, even, it's the folks, it's the folks in Congress. That's even in the newspaper and things that maybe Congress can see sometimes. So if someone sees a negative number or one with a fractional count, they think we made a mistake. So it's for the not as uh -huh. sophisticated so, data user. So, so let me maybe ask this a different way then. So, so you think, it, 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 would you posit then that that list that you made was not sort of lightly made, that the same level of consideration that went into what you're going to change, like those, you really, the Census Bureau currently views those as hard constraints that cannot be. Uh, P putting it this way, we wish that most of our data users had your quantitative literacy. <laughs> Oh, please. Yeah. Um, I believe you had a slide with the, the PPF curve. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so, in regards to privacy, there was kind of like a natural metric of that curve with the epsilon. But in regards to like utility, I was there, is there like a natural measure of how you measure something like that? Right. So what we've been looking at is actually doing usability studies and talking to a wide swath of the public in terms of who responds, who doesn't, who trusts government, who trusts government with their information, who is completely jaded. It is a real mixture out there. And we've learned that it is, it is possible but difficult to measure something called a marginal social benefit to a very diverse public. Um, and we'll make that the last one. Okay. To what extent uh, is a public the synthesizing, the syntheticness of the data? It, uh, for our synthetic products that are out right now, we, um, especially with, with the Survey of Income and Program Participation, we put out a synthetic SIP, and we put out a traditional public use SIP, and we were very clear, synthetic. That's the first thing people see. As we are putting out more products, we are, and I'm really, I really mean this, we are looking to be more forthcoming with our methods and our algorithms so that you know that what we're doing, I guess in the spirit of competitions, we are looking to see whether the research community can help us improve upon our own algorithms to make them even safer. All right, thanks again. Thank you.